right, who's ready for some word? Amen. All right, let's get in here. Let's get in the word today. Turn in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 12 and Matthew chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 12 and Matthew chapter 13. Thank you, worship team, for taking us where we needed to go. Uh, now, okay, amen. All right. Hebrews 12 and Matthew 13. I'm going to read both of those and then I'm going to take off and preach as long as time will allow me to. Y'all good? Amen. If God's been good to you this week, say amen. amen. If you need God to help you out with something, say amen. amen. Everybody could use a little help sometimes. Ain't nothing wrong with that. Uh, I, I'm so blessed again to have you here with us today. Uh, can we take 10 seconds and actually put our hands together and go crazy for all of our online audience that's watching us from all over the world right now? I'm in a season more now than ever in my life where I'm honored to speak to whoever will listen. And anybody that would take time to let me pour into their life, I'm honored by that. So I don't take for granted the privilege that it is to pour into a people. Uh, so since I can't tell each one of y'all, if y'all can't tell by now, I'm a talking pastor. I can't tell every one of y'all. But would you tell everybody around you, your pastor loves you. Your pastor loves you. All right, let's get in the word. Father, I thank you for this word. I thank you for what you want to communicate today. Open our hearts and minds to receive everything that you want to say. Let my words be your words and penetrate hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Two scriptures, Matthew 13. I actually start there. Matthew 13 is the parable of the wheat and tares that I read last week, and I didn't get through it all. And then we'll come back and read Hebrews chapter 12. That's going to be the best way to go. We are now... Uh, I believe in week six, maybe week seven, but I think we're in week six of this series. Uh, and for those of you that are just getting accustomed to me, this is the way I really love to preach. I, now, now, I'm a preacher, and I'm, we're going to have what we need to do, but I love the line upon line thing. I'm, I'm known, uh, if you talk to All Nations Louisville, I'm known to not take four weeks on a series, but take three or four months. And I, I come alive in teaching like that because I believe that too often we have a church in America that is inspired but ignorant and so so we love to be pushed to a moment but we leave that moment and have no idea what to do on Monday and so one of the things that I'm trying to do as I communicate this to you over these weeks is make sure that it's clear enough for you to take today's sermon and go preach it tomorrow that you know exactly what you heard and you know how to multiply it so I come alive in this but everybody say but I'm still Pentecostal. So that, that, that means teaching at All Nations South and teaching at All Nations Louisville don't mean quiet. I want to preach to a people who can holler as much over teaching as much as they do blessings. So look at somebody and say, we don't do sleepy church here. We don't do sleepy church. <laughs> Matthew chapter 13 verse 24 says another parable he put forth to them saying, the kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the grain had sprouted and produced a crop, then the tares also appeared. So the servants of the owner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? Have you ever had somebody look at your life and say, I thought you was a Christian? Mm -hmm. and ain't it something that they think just because we got saved and just because we gave our life to God that somehow we're supposed to have it all together and not experience any trouble? I don't know if anybody's like me. I honestly found a little bit more trouble post-salvation. I, I found a little bit more warfare post-salvation. And the difference between us and them is not that we are saved and don't have storms. It, it, it's not that we're saved and they have storms and we don't. It's the only fact the difference is that our house is built upon the rock. Somebody say yes. And their house is built upon the sand. So the storms are still going to come, but when the storm goes, my house is still going to be standing while others houses are susceptible to falling that is the difference the only difference between us and them is i have help with me somebody say that with me i have help with me come on shout it at somebody i got help with me that's the only reason i can make it i got help verse 28 he said to them an enemy has done this 
The servant said to him, do you want us then to go and gather them up? But he said, no, lest while you gather up the tares, you also uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And at the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, first gather together the tares and bind them in a bundle to burn them. But gather the wheat into my barn. Now, I've never tied these two scriptures together before, but we're going to make sense of it today. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 1. If you want to flip there quickly, you can do so quickly on them online Bibles. Them old Bibles, you know you hear them paper, the, the pages flipping. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 1 says, Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside, let us, let us, somebody say let us, not God deliver me, let me willingly lay down. Okay. In other words, this thing right here is in my authority to decide if I'm going this direction or not. This is my responsibility, and it is within my decisive power to do what he's telling me to do. Therefore, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, it's quiet again, the sin that so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Tell your neighbor, this is going to be good. This is going to be good. All right. We are in a series right now called Rated M for Mature because what we have found ourselves in is a need to grow up. I heard it at the top of the year that God said, I need a mature body. So I've been looking to dive into this. And, and as we dive into this conversation, I can't speak for England. I've never been. I can't speak for Russia. I can't speak for other countries and all that. But I am fairly acquainted with American church and I'm fairly acquainted with American culture. And, and, and I've been part of different streams of the American church, and, and, and I've studied even some that I'm not necessarily a part of. And so as I take a look at the generational plights of our Christian life, what I see common today is a word I brought up last week that made some cringe just when I said it, and that is mixture. Mixture. Now, I, I think a few people have been confused by this series, uh, I, I, and I know I had to kind of take Louisville suit through some of this because they've heard me preach Unbothered, and they've heard me preach Amazing Grace, and they've heard me preach Road to Romans. But I told you last week that I realized, I came to a, 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 an epiphany, if you will, that our movement cannot be a grace movement simply by avoiding the topics of lifestyle change. Come on, uh, 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 by, by avoiding the topics of conviction, by avoiding things like sin and iniquity. And in conversation with Dr. Hart Ramsey this week, uh, we were discussing the fact that grace without a new context for sin conversation is an incomplete new covenant. It's an incomplete new covenant. And so what I realized is, is that grace is a mature message. Now, I know we like to take it to the shallow, but grace is a mature message. It is not the milk of the word. Grace is the meat of the word. And some of us loved ideas like unbothered, which was to teach us to have grace for them as they come. Look at somebody and say, we need to have grace for them. We need to have grace for them. It was to teach us to have grace for them as they come. But can I tell you what I watched happen? Y'all going to get mad at me right now. Some of us got so unbothered that we started to get unbothered by our own sin. I mean, talk to me online. It's all right. Uh, I, I, and so when, when I was raised, and many of you were raised like me, uh, there was, there was a, a deep separation between those who served God and those who didn't. There was, a, there was a, a, a clear line of debarkation. The defining lines were very clear. Now, I got to be clear on this side. A lot of it was legalism. A lot of it was stuff that you can't find in the Bible. But I will say there was clarity. 
There was clarity of who is who and what is what. The way they behaved was much different. And now I'm going to meddle a little bit and make you mad today. Tell your neighbor it's okay. That's all right. The, the way they talked was different. The way, oh, Father God. The way they acted was different. I really want to preach y'all cars and houses. I promise I do. Uh, the way they carried themselves, their conduct, their behavior, I mean, silence of the lambs, was, was very different, was different from everybody else. You could be in a room and easily spot who was a saint serving God and who was someone that was not. All right, y'all ain't gonna like me today. Now today, this is very much more difficult to decipher because they'll pass you a joint and a track at the same time. Amen. We want to have conversations about who the Lord is while we're blitzed. And we come to Sunday just to detox from Saturday. What is that? How, how are we able to do that? It is the ability to compartmentalize. Compartmentalization. To compartmentalize. It is the ability to take this part of your life, this Sunday morning, this, this, we may, y'all might as well go sit down. They ain't gonna shout today. This part of our life, we're able to take, uh, I was kidding. Uh, we're able to take, <laughs> we're able to take this part of our gathering lifestyle. They was ready. They was ready. We're able to take this timeline of our our week and compartmentalize it. We take this gathering time and we can draw a line around it to where we experience it, but we never let it infiltrate any other part of our life. Not understanding that Jesus did not die to create a religion that we pay homage to on Sunday two hours a week. But Jesus came to live and to die to cause us to become something. I know you don't want to go there. But to cause us to become something that we were not before we had him. And we will become something that during our lifetime will impact a generation and a world for Forever. We lost scriptures along the line of things like he called you to come out from among them and be ye. So I mean, it don't, it, you, you, you throw that in the religious category. It's in the same Bible as your grace. And, and you are not, now listen, you are not to judge what you are in, but can I help you? You are supposed to be different than what you are in. Glory to God. And so you getting people moved and drawn into the salvation experience was not supposed to happen by you debating them. And it was not supposed to happen by your theological prowess. It was not supposed to be your ability to out-argue them. It was supposed to be that my life Ah, Jesus. I think Ephesians said, I need you to be living epistles now, meaning that the Bible did not stop. Now the Bible is your life. You are to live this epistle, and there's, your life is supposed to be such a witness that it shined before them, and there was something about me so noticeably different from you that provoked you to want to know what it was that I had, and they wanted to pursue what it was that you had because they saw that it had a difference in your life but now we look in a room and we don't know who's a Christian and who's not a Christian we don't know who's in the fold and who's out of the fold why because we all telling the same jokes we all having the same conversation I mean, talk to me, baby. We're, we're, we're having conversations that are the same we're, we're, we're all drunk at the same places I mean, I can't hear nobody. I mean, just, I, I, well, come on. All, all looking at the same things they're looking at, going to the same websites they're going to, go, uh, <laughs> go, it, visiting the same spaces they're visiting. I'm preaching already. And what that tells me is, is there is conflict in the garden. Conflict in the garden. Because you only have mixed behavior if you have mixed Seed. I only have mixed behavior 
a mixture of behavior if I have a mixture of seed. You only have a mixing, a, a mixing of things coming out of your life because you are allowing a mixture of things to go into your life. Now, I'm having a hard, a hard time getting an amen that don't have the last name hard. So look at somebody and say, you can shout over sin too. You can shout over sin too. Uh, I, now, I've been preaching the last few weeks, and it's not, not necessarily crazy deep, but, but I touched around the idea of iniquity. How many of y'all remember that? The past couple of weeks, we've been talking about the idea of iniquity and how iniquity is different than sin. It's a different conversation than sin. It's actually a completely different manifestation than sin. Repentance of sin is asking God to forgive you of something you did. It was a fruit. It was a behavior. It was something we committed against God or something that God asked us to do, and we failed to do it. There are only two kinds of sin. There is the sin, y'all don't like this, there's the sin of commission, and there's the sin of omission. The sin of commission and the sin of omission. All the sins of omission are the things that God said do and you did not do. There's the sins of commission, meaning I committed it. It's the stuff he said don't do and I did. And so those are usually the, co the commission sins are usually outward. They're usually visible. They can be seen. You know you did it. You know you need to repent. I want to get God. I want his blood to cover this activity so I can move on and get new harvest. And so, but but there's something else that, that is an inner force that, 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 that is in all all of us that we are born with, that we are born, uh, and it was the iniquity, we're born bent towards, we're born twisted towards certain things, and, and iniquity is not sin. Iniquity tends to lean more, I told you, I'll review, to the why I did what I did instead of the what it was that I did. So the Bible says that iniquity, or the why, can stretch back three or four generations, that's Exodus 20, that my my great grandfather can start something and in my lifetime I am now swinging against something full blown in my life that was a seed in his mm -hmm. So, so now, now it, it was a seed in his soul, but it's running rampant in my life. Why? Because I told you with every generation, if it's not confronted, it grows. It expands. It increases. Look at what is being blasted in our face as an American generation that two generations ago could be kept in a closet. What, what, what the lady say at the, at the press conference? I, uh, uh, it's not that it wasn't there. It was just so small it could be kept in a closet. Because it was still a seed. Now the next generation comes and it can't be contained quite as much because it is growing. And then the next generation comes and what used to be kept in a closet is now paraded in streets. Why? Because it has grown. Whatever I don't confront will grow in the bloodline. So what you used to have to fight to find, now you can find with one click on your phone. Glory to God. You can have it all you want. Why? Because with every generation, whatever is not confronted in the family, if somebody in that line don't confront that devil, it's going to grow and grow until it's uncontainable in future generations. So whenever you are dealing with somebody that has things that seem to be uncontrollable in their life, it is out of control in their generation, but somebody else could have stopped this thing back when it was in seed form. Yes. Am I preaching all right so far? If you got me, say yes. <clears throat> so we get saved and we're born again. We're born again in the spirit. And the Bible says in our inner man, we delight in the law of God. Meaning in my spirit that has just been raised to life. I want to do what God says do. I have a new desire in me post-salvation to do everything that God has called me to do. I have a spirit that is producing godly desires, but I still have iniquity. 
embedded in my soul the next generation uh, dimension excuse me that God is trying to get in to save which means that when I got saved at the altar my spirit man was transformed but my soul was not impacted I leave that transformation go home and scripture says now that you've come back to life work on your soul's salvation my spirit man is corrected in an instant. My flesh man will never be corrected, which is why it has to go back to dust here. It can't go there. But the thing that is in the middle, somebody said there's something in the middle. There was something in the middle. The thing that is in the middle is my responsibility. My responsibility. And so, so he says, I, I'm trying to get in. You, I, the, the soul, the, the, excuse me, the spirit thing was done without any work from you. I did that. I paid the price for that. I shed the blood for that. I died for that. I took care of that for you. But now, because life is going to come from your heart. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Out of your heart shall flow the issues of life, not your spirit. Out of your soul flows your fruit. So my spirit man shoots the desire, but my soul man is the thing that decides that's what I'm going to manifest. And God said, I need to get in there. In where? In your will, in your passions, in your desires, in your longings, in your feelings, in those experiences, in your knowledge, in your intellect, in your perceptions. That's the soul. And iniquity has gone in the soul to produce a conflict. It's there, it's there to start a fight because I've had a genuine experience with God. I've had a flip in my spirit, man, and my inner man. I delight in the law of God. I don't believe, I, I'm sorry, I don't believe people set out to be hypocritical. I don't believe somebody wakes up and says, you know what, I want to be fake today. I, I don't think anybody chooses hypocrisy, but I believe, especially in the way that we have constructed American church, they get in settings like this, and people perceive that they have it all together, and so they learn. It's learned behavior. They learn to hide the part of them that ain't going to act right. I'm preaching better than you talking. And so what it produces is it produces mixture in the garden. Mixture in the garden. Mixture in life. Do you see what I'm talking about? I liken the Old Testament iniquity to the New Testament Hebrews 12.1. The writer says in Hebrews that while we are running our race, lay aside every weight and the sin. <laughs> not a sin. Not some sins. The sin. Sin. The struggle that you were handed that a lot of y'all didn't ask for. The fight that you woke up one day having in your soul and not even sure how this thing got here. Hey, it's tight in here, but holler at your neighbor and say, loosen up a little bit. Loosen up a little bit. You, listen, we ain't got to get tight about iniquity. This is a freedom message. This is a message about being set free. Let's reach in the closet and pull some of these things into the light so Jesus Christ can deal with these things. That's where freedom comes. Where? You shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. The fact is, ain't nobody in this building got it all together. I wish you'd talk to me. So everybody that's on your road, just take a look right now. They don't have it all together. Hey, I, thank you, thank you. I mean, I, thank you. I needed that. Uh, uh, they don't, uh, in fact, let's just do this. Just look at your neighbor, even if they're a stranger, and say, I already know you ain't got it together. Come on. Come on, tell them, tell them. I, even if it's a stranger, if it's your husband or your wife, say, I'm very, very aware. That you don't. Amen. I felt it getting tight. I got to loosen it up a little bit. My Lord, Quincy, you preach on sin. Everybody get nervous. Glory to God. So, so, there is such a thing as sin in the new covenant believer. 
There is such a thing. Now, it may not do what it did in the legalistic culture, but it's still going to produce something. There is still going to be harvest from every seed that is sowed. There is a such thing as sin. It's when you fall short. Fall short of God's idea. Fall short. It's those, those inner forces. I got things in me that really want to do God's stuff. I also got things in me that really want to sabotage all of it. So you got David, the mighty king, and he's godly enough. He's got enough God things in him to make him a great king. But still down in that soul, he's got enough little boy in him that's willing to destroy it all. Uh, and so you got to understand the mature part of you and the immature part of you are in conflict with one another. And they make you want to get up one day and look in your field and look in your garden and say, how the heck did I get here? How did I get here? How did I end up wanting to do right but can't do right? Come on, talk to me, Paul. The things I want to do, I can't seem to do. But the things that I don't want to do, I keep seeming to do them. It's the conflict in the garden. I sowed good seed. Where did all these tares come from? How did I get this? Matthew 13 said, for some of us, an enemy did this. An enemy did this. I want to come right now and relieve a few of y'all from the weight of feeling like you keep ruining everything. Some of you were handed a battle that you did not choose to sign up for. In fact, let me just say it this way. Adam handed all of us. A battle that we did not intend to fight. I woke up with sin because of what was handed to me. I was born into sin because of what Adam handed me. I have to deal with sin. I have to deal with things that maybe I never created. Maybe I never sowed. Maybe I never started. But if they were handed to me, I still got to confront them. I still am responsible for that. You came into adulthood with needs that were not met, with holes in your soul, deficiencies on the inside of your life, and now you're sitting here with all of these internal struggles saying, why do I always end up in this kind of relationship? Why, why do I always end up in this same cycle? Come on, talk to me, somebody. Why do I always end up with that kind of person? Why, why do I always end up overindulging? Why am I always trying to find something to numb the pain. Why is it I can never seem to be settled in my life and you're not sure and you can't find an answer for what you're doing is because now we're getting past what and we're starting to find out why. And the writer in Hebrews said there is such thing as the sin. The sin. You may have got rid of almost all of them the moment you came to Christ. But there's that, the sin. There's that one thing. Y yes, there is. There's that, there's that one thing. At least one. You know, some of us have carved it down to about 17. But there's, there's, there's at least one. One, the sin. Now, pay attention right here. This is important context. All sin is weight. But not every weight is sin. Yay, yeah. There's some things that you lay aside while running your race that aren't necessarily sins, but they are weights. Man, I got so much to tell you. I don't even know how I'm going to fit all this in this. But, but you got to understand that there are, there are some things that are just generally wrong. Wrong for everybody. That, that, that there are things that are wrong. Thou shalt not steal. They're wrong for everybody, right? Then there is a higher order. Somebody shout higher order. There is a higher order. There will be things that are not wrong. They're wrong for you. Now you're getting it. You catch it. That is a weight. There are things that are wrong for everybody in this room. Thou shalt not commit adultery. It's wrong across the board. But then there are things that you can do that I can't do. 
There are things uh, that, 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 that I can do that you cannot do. And I know it's a higher order because it has to do with my future. It has to do with my calling and it has to do with my purpose. And you can do it. And let me just talk to a few of y'all. The worst thing you can do is trying to bring people under condemnation for a personal conviction God told you to live by. I need some of y'all to stop sending other people to hell over a standard he gave you for your calling. I, 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 and I need to understand that because of my future, there may be some things that God demands of me that he don't demand of you. There may be some things that he wants from you that you ought not look sideways at me if you see me doing what he told you not to. Okay, oh, Jesus Christ. Okay, th there are places that I cannot go. And it's not because they're a sin, but it's because of the calling that is on my life. See, we don't even know how to get with this stuff no more. Uh, th th there may be some people that you can hang around that I can't hang around. Why? I can't get where I'm going if I hang around them. So I got to dismiss myself. And it's not because they're a sin. It's not because they're wrong. But because of where God is taking me, for me, they are a weight. And if I stay in a weight just because it's not a sin, I'll slow down my progress, dragging them behind me, not because they are sinful people, but because for me, they may not be bondage, but they might be baggage. Somebody say, I hear you. So there comes a day, there comes a day where you got to get past just wrestling with, am I going to do what God said don't do? That's the lowest order. That's it. I got to go to a higher order. Not is it wrong? Is it wrong for me? Which also means I got to know me to find out what's wrong for me. Which means I can't base my standard on whoever I'm trying to be. I got <laughs> that's, that's my thing right there. So, so now, now, you got to understand we got the higher order. Not is it wrong? Is it wrong for me? But there's a higher order than that. There's another order on top of that. You, you, got pa you done got past the law of sin. You, now you've got past the law of conviction. There's a higher law than that called the law of wisdom. Wow. Not is it wrong. Not is it wrong for me. Is it wise? <laughs> is it wise? Uh, it, it, there's levels. Do you see what I'm saying? There's levels that God wants you to walk through. And you got to understand that all of these are not just decisions, they're seeds. They're seeds that bring a harvest in the garden. Now, y'all all right? These sin, I, I told you I likened iniquity to the sin of Hebrews 12. The, the struggle that makes you sit here and be so quiet while I preach. That one, that one. The struggle on the inside of you that, that some of you have yet to even be able to pinpoint what that thing is in me. The, the thing, listen, in your teens, you're, you're, you're starting to deal with it. Actually, write this down. Iniquity has to be tracked. Write that down. Iniquity has to be tracked. Iniquity has to be tracked. In your 20s, you're starting to deal with it. You're, you're, to some of us, you're teens. If you were me, it was teens. In your teens, you're starting to deal with this thing in you. Late 20s, you, you may be starting to say, you know, I think something's wrong. In your 30s and 40s, you start looking and saying stuff like, I think I've been here before. This ain't my first rodeo with this thing. I have confronted this devil before. Now, beyond that, I don't know. I haven't lived there yet. So you can tell me left of service if you beyond that what the, what the next cycle is. But what I'm telling you is it takes time to track the sin. It takes cycles 
to track these sins because it, it is that. It is cyclical, which means in a cyclical sin, a cyclical sin is not constant in your life. It's not an everyday struggle in your life. This is a thing that usually revisits you right about the time God's going to do something strategic. Lord, I, Lord, this is good preaching. This thing rears its head in moments of God opportunity. Mm -hmm. you, you, you got Peter, and Peter has been following Jesus for three and a half years, training as a disciple. Now it's coming down to the moment. Jesus is saying, it's time for me to go. It's better for you if I leave. Jesus is about to die, resurrect, go back to heaven, and they are going to shift now from being the 12 disciples into a role of authority as the 12 apostles. So we're going from a trainee, we're in transition, from a trainee into someone's standing in an office and what happens right when Jesus is about to be taken from them and change the whole game for them Peter says I'm going fishing what was Peter doing when Jesus found him fishing when I found you I called you out of fishing and now that I'm ready to launch you Look what showed right back up. I'm going fishing. I got a question. How does Peter still have a boat? Why do you still have a boat to go to? I, you've been with Jesus three and a half years. Jesus is not training you to go back fishing. Jesus is training you to go into ministry. Why do you got a boat to go back to? And why are you thinking about fishing right now? Okay, I, I got to find somebody. Some of the reason that you always got a life to go back to is because there's some stuff you just won't sink. Y'all not talking to me. Peter should have got rid of the boat the moment Jesus said, come follow me and I'm going to make you fishers of men. The boat needs to go down, which means I got to deal with y'all's plan B's. I got to talk to you about your plan B on this Sunday morning. Anything, glory to God, y'all feel that chill in the room? I feel, yeah. <laughs> Anything that you still got on the side to go back to. Any number you got saved just in, y'all see, I, yeah. Uh, uh, any idea that you have built as a whole backup plan just in case God's plan don't work. Any memory you got to revisit. Any drug you you got as a crutch to fall back on. Any man or woman you always seem to call when moments of transition come, you need to sink your ship. Would you holler at somebody and say, it's time to sink the boat. It's time to sink the boat. It's time to sink the boat. Why? Because when God gets ready to do something in your life, you've got to remove every temptation you've got to be able to backpedal and retreat to something God's already set you free from. I'm going to give somebody right now five seconds to shout about sinking boats. Come on, tell three or four people I'm going to sink my boat. He should have never been thinking about fishing, and he should have never still had a boat to go to. What is your the sin? With Adam, it's rebellion. With Noah, it's drunkenness. With David, it's lust. With Solomon, it's women. With Peter, it's his mouth. Come on, what is your boat? What is your boat? What is your thing you go back to? What's your crutch in crisis? What do I lean on when things start following, falling apart? With Abraham, it's lying. The sin, the cyclical sin, the thing that pops up when doors start opening. You can tell an iniquity because it wants to come back up at strategic moments. Watch it. Track it. Track it. 
Now, why do I need to track it? Because, because right whenever God's about to do something great, there it is. Staring right back at you in the face. Why? Because while you were getting ready to have a moment with God to move you out of a cycle and into a new season, it wants you to make the same mistake. So you got to go all the way around this mountain all over again. And the iniquity is not there to fight you forever. It's there to make sure you waste major moments. It's to hit you here. So you got to go around the mountain again. You in your 20s, I can get out. I can get, nope, there it is. I did it again. 30s, I can move up. Nope, I seem to fall right back in it again. Now I got to go all the way back around this mountain again. 41, here's a great opportunity God has given me. Nope, I did it again. There you go, all the way around the same mountain again. And then all of a sudden, you look in a mirror, and your face is full of gray hairs. And God help us. If we waste our whole life losing to the same cycle. Now, over in Matthew 13, y'all all right? Over in Matthew chapter 13, we've been talking about a man getting up one day and finding two different things in his garden. I'm going to find a place to close here. Now, I'm going to take a little bit of liberty right here. But I want you to take note of the fact, as I was reading it this week, I saw this. It's interesting to me that when the man hears about the terrace, he don't seem surprised. Everybody else seems surprised by the terrace in his garden. Could it be that he knew what was growing in his garden the whole time. But he had been able to hide his harvest so far from onlookers. There comes a point, there's going to come a point for every seed where the ground can no longer hide the harvest. There's, go mm, there's going to come a time for every seed where the ground is not going to hide what's been growing. Heater, Hebrews later says, let, let no bitter roots spring up. Spring up quickly, boom. Now we understand just because it happened quickly didn't mean it happened quickly. It came up quickly, but it's been growing for a long time. It's been fermenting for a long time. It's been root, uh, growing a root system for a long time. But he said it'll spring up quickly. Where did this come from? Boom. Just spring up quickly. Boom. Where did it come from? And he said when that springs up, it defiles many. He says if you don't get control of what's in your ground, it's not only going to hurt you, it's going to hurt everybody who loves you. It will defile many. It's going to hurt everything connected to you. And he's looking at his garden. And I think it's great to take note of the fact that he does the right thing. Now, I'm teaching. Stay with me here. He's looking at his garden and he does the right thing. The first thing he does is take personal inventory. Personal inventory. He looks at what has come in it. And this is how you know he's not a victim. Because victims will blame everything or everybody else, even if it is their fault. Excuse me. Amen. Uh, uh, victims blame everything, even if it's their fault, on somebody else. The guy looked at his garden, and he stands back and takes time. He says, let, let me think. Did I do that? Did I plant that? Is there anything in me that could have produced that? Did I make any choices that may have brought this harvest because when you keep ending up at the same place you've got to be willing to take personal inventory when I keep getting this harvest I've got to be willing to take a look at what's going on when I keep ending up at the same place all the time different age different scenery new wrinkle on my face but same old stuff I've got to be willing to examine me and you've got to be bold enough to ask you is this a result of something I am doing yeah. amen is this a result of, of my sin? Is this a result of a decision I've made? Personal inventory. Tell your neighbor personal inventory. And so you've got to be honest with yourself about did I create this mess 
or did I not? And if you created the mess, then you've got the authority to go to God and take ownership of it, not blame anybody else for it, and say, God, it's me standing in the need of prayer. Jesus said, you are an advocate with the Father, faithful and just to forgive me of all my sins and cleanse me of all unrighteousness. I'm asking for my own grace and mercy. Grace, I'm asking you to give me what I don't deserve. And mercy, I'm asking you to get in between me and this harvest. And don't let it hit me like it should. I know I deserve it, but I'm asking you to have mercy on me. And God, forgive me of what I've sown here. And don't let this harvest hit me with the magnitude of impact I have sown. Has anybody ever had to go to God and ask him for your own grace and ask him for your own mercy and need because you know you screwed up? Yeah. If you've done that before, somebody ought to be honest and say amen. 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 But then, after thorough examination, he looks at it and says, an enemy did this. Now, again, we like to just go straight to binding the devil. Step one is take personal inventory. But once I've taken personal inventory and I can't arrive to the conclusion, I arrive to the same one he had. An enemy has done this. He said, I'm dealing with stuff in my life that I did not create. And I ended last week by telling you that these are the times that are usually going to define the success of your life. It's not how you handle the mess you created. It's how you respond to cleaning up messes other people made for you. <coughs> And, and somebody, he's not even named. We don't even get to understand the, the nature of the character. We're not even told who the enemy is. But somebody from the outside comes and sows bad seed in his field. And now it's come up. And now he's got a harvest to deal with. I, I wonder, has anybody have, had to clean up a mess you didn't make? It is very difficult. I just got to be all the way honest with y'all. It is very difficult to stay in grace. When you're constantly cleaning up other people's messes. It's hard. It's hard. And so now he's got to deal with his emotions. Sir, do you want us to go and pull it all up? No. No, 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 no. Leave it. Let both grow together. Uh, would you just look at your neighbor and say, I don't want to make you mad. But there are no quick fixes. No quick fixes. It's normal whenever we see undesirable harvest for us to run out in warfare and immediately go and start just jerking everything up and throwing all the seed around it and messing everything up. And he says, no, wait. And Jesus said, this is the kingdom. Wait. Jesus says, there is a dimension in the life of a kingdom citizen, a season in the life of a kingdom citizen where good things and bad things are both going to pop up together. Because the seed that I'm, pay attention here, the seed that I'm sowing now is not going to show up now. The seed I'm planting now, I'm not going to harvest now. That means I'm saved, but I'm still living in yesterday's seed. You missed it. I'm saved, but I'm still seeing all these tears in my life. Why? Because I'm not living in today's seed. I'm living in yesterday's harvest. So you got a Christian that looks like God ain't doing nothing for him. But if you hang around my life for a little bit, you will see that even in today's harvest, which may not be good, I'm still sowing good seed. Even while I'm reaping hate, I'm sowing kindness. While I'm reaping financial depravity, I'm sowing and believing for tomorrow's financial provision. Even while today I'm living alone, I'm sowing that God will bring me a companion. Hello, somebody. Even while I'm living in kids that I let go loose, God, I'm sowing seeds now that are going to reap a harvest that will bring the prodigals back in to walk with you. You haven't seen the harvest of today's seed. You don't start sowing good seed until you get saved, which means I may have got saved, but that don't mean I'm not still living in yesterday's seed. 
Which means, for some of us, you can be honest and say, there were seasons where I was saved, but I was still a mess. Saved, but still had hell running all over my life. Bad harvest everywhere. I don't know if anybody, I'm trying to preach this as clear as I can, but I got to wind this down. Let me do it this way. When the sin shows up, we'll end here. I got, look at somebody say, be back next week. Be back next week. When the sin shows up, I got good news about the sin. I got good news about it. The iniquity, the sin that so easily besets you. I mean, easy, easily, the iniquity, there's a thousand of them that can't get me. There's that one thing. And I wish I had a few honest people. There's that one that when it shows up, it easily, don't even try hard, it easily knocks me off my feet. I got good news for you about that one thing. The good news about that one thing is if you and once you track it and find out what it is, your enemy is not a creator. So there will never be new sin in the bloodline that you didn't start. So if I'm fighting something and I didn't know where it came from and I track it, that means if I track it one time, I can trace it every time. If I track it once, I can trace it forever. I, listen, y'all missing it. I said if I track it once, I can trace it forever. Because the enemy, the next time God's about to promote you, he's not going to bring you a brand new thing. He's always going to revisit you with a boat you didn't sink. And if you beat that thing one time and he comes back with that thing another time, the next time it comes up, if you trace it, you can beat it easy again. And some of you, you've already slayed this thing 10 years, 10 times, 20 times, 30 times over this one thing. And I cannot promise you that you are never going to face this thing again. But this one thing I can promise you, If you beat it one time, the next time it comes up, you can say, I took on the lion, I took on the bear, and Goliath, you just another big thing to take down. It may be bigger, it may look different, it may show up in a different person, but I can promise you that the same God that gave me the victory over it last time will also deliver you into my hands this time. And I'm not going to let you send me through the same old cycle. I'm going to step out of the cycle and move into a new dimension of life into a new glory that God has for me. If you're with me, would you just jump on your feet and take 10 seconds and praise God and let your enemy know that I'm not going around. Come on. Let your enemy know that I'm not going around this mountain again. Let your enemy know with this praise that I refuse to go around this same cycle. I'm going to track it and I'm going to trace it and I'm going to conquer it. Would you holler at three people and say I'm not going to lose this time. I'm not going to lose this time. I'm not going to lose this time. Hallelujah. Holler at somebody and say I'm not going around this again. I'm not going around it again. Now, how many of you can say that that you think you've tracked it? A lot of us have a good idea what our the thing is. Just tell your neighbor, I know what it is by now. Now tell them I'm not about to tell you, though. (laughs) Everyone standing with me. You're coming into a season and a time that I didn't even get everywhere I wanted to go, but you're coming into a season where you're tired. I'm going to throw some stuff out next week that I I believe is going to blow this thing up. Last week I told you what iniquity is. This week I told you you've got to track it. Next week I'm going to tell you how to destroy it. 
And I know some of you have been frustrated through this pace a little bit because you're like, is this just something we got to fight forever? Is this just something I got to know? There is a day where you get to take that thing's head off and you get to hold it up and say, I have conquered this thing in my bloodline once and for all. We're going to kill it. And we're going to purify the bloodline. And there's a spiritual dynamic. I'm going to speak where this can happen. Can I pray over you before we leave? Father, I thank you for this people. And I thank you for what you're doing in them right now. For the clarity you're bringing to our garden. Father, I thank you for giving us a holy distaste for mixture. Father, give us a distaste for dual harvest. But we're asking you through the decisions we make, the responsibility we take to purify our garden, create in us a clean heart, renew a right spirit within us so that we can manifest that which the kingdom has called us to manifest. God, I thank you for giving us the authority of confrontation, that we would see it and not run from it and see it and not fall to it. And I decree and declare over every person who has this plan B in their pocket that you would give them the passion and the power to sink that thing once and for all. I really want to deal with that. And if you say I got a plan B and there's some things that I know I need to just move on from and confront the future and get rid of the fear of it. If that's you and you say I got a plan B, would you just shoot your hand up? Be honest. Nobody looking around. Yeah, there's plan B's all over the room. I know. It's all right. Father, I thank you that today we poke holes in our own boat. We take authority over this thing that we've been holding on to. Father, for some of us, it means we've got to delete people. For some of us, it means we got to delete plans. For some of us, it means we got to move on from the fear of the future and take a step forward. But God, whatever that plan B is, I ask you to help us put that thing underwater once and for all. May we sink that thing so we don't get confronted by temptation to go back fishing again. I don't have time to fish another season. I don't have time to fish another round. There's too much in front of me to worry about keeping a plan behind me. Lord, we lay that thing down and we lay it down once and for all. Father, I ask you to help us do this. Let us have that moment with you every day this week where we talk ourselves out of what we've been trying to hold on to. Lord, may we get rid of any relationships that are our plan B. May we get rid of any ideas, any ideologies, any experience that we go back to and I speak to every crutch oh yeah I speak to every crutch that we go back and grab when crisis hits whether that be addiction whether it be depression whether it be a person or whether it be a thing Father, we burn that crutch. We get rid of that thing. We close the door. You told us, make no provision for the flesh. So we close the door. We shut the door on every opportunity to go grab our crutch again. So, Father, in times of crisis, may we take our crisis to you. May we take our pain to you. May we create our soul time with you. You said, bring me your cares. Cast your cares upon the Lord so we throw our crutch down and we lay ourselves in your lap and I thank you for restoring us bringing us back to health and making us better than before in Jesus name may the Lord bless you and may he keep you may he make his face shine upon you may he establish you and may he give you peace and may your boat sink so your future can open in Jesus name Amen and amen. I love you all nation south. On your way out, meet a few people. Tell everybody I'm sinking my boat. I'm sinking my boat. Register for prayer. Service is open at 12 for registration. I'll see you next week.